Okay, I'm gonna get started. I'm gonna do my little introduction, Wanda, and then introduce you. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to San Francisco Public Library's virtual library and today's online screening of the powerful film, Belly of the Beast. Today's screening will be followed by a discussion with activists Kelly Dillon and Cynthia Chan Chandler, who are featured in the film and will be in conversation with Wanda Sabir about their fight to end forced sterilization in California's prisons. We are thankful again to be partnering with Ms. Sabir, who has shared her woundfulness programs with us through the library. You can find these on our YouTube page and are humbled, humbled to be included again in her work to assist the Black community in trauma healing. I'm Shauna Sherman, manager of the African American Center here at the main library. Before we get started, it should be acknowledged the library is located in the area now known as San Francisco, which is on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramaytush Ohlone peoples of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the original peoples of this land, the Ramaytush Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as caretakers of this place. We recognize that we benefit from living, working, and learning on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramaytush community. Today's program is part of our One City, One Book citywide reading of This Is Ear Hustle, a book based on the podcast of the same name, which tells the unheard stories that delve deeper into experiences of incarceration. Pick up the book at the library or check out the reading and discussion with the authors on our YouTube page. There are still many more opportunities to participate in programs, readings, film screenings through December. Find more information on sfpl.org and thank you to the friends of the San Francisco Public Library for their support of this program and all library programs. Before I introduce our moderator, I wanna say a little bit about how our program will work today. After a brief introduction by Ms. Sabir, we will screen the movie through Zoom and registered participants can find a link and passcode in our chat for inter independent viewing through November 19th. The film is also available for checkout at the library. After the screening, we will reconvene in the same Zoom room and continue our discussion. And now on to our show. Ms. Sabir is a journalist. She publishes Wanda's Picks, college professor, virtual artist, deaf psychologist, and poet who believes in the power of art to change and shape social movements, as well as assist in trauma healing and memory reclamation work. Co-founder of Ma'afa Ma San Francisco Bay Area, she launched Woundfulness Gatherings in March, 2021. She is the recipient of 2019's Distinguished 400 Award, which is given by 400, the 400 Years of African American History Commission established by the U.S. Department of Interior and in, administered by the National Park Service. Again, we are so glad to be partnering again with Wanda Sabir, so please join me in welcoming her to our program. <laughs> thank you so much, Shana, and thank you, City of San Francisco and the San Francisco Public Library and African American Center specifically for just, you know, hanging with me and, and our, our um, organization and, and bringing these wonderful, wonderful conversations, uh, important conversations to the community and none could be more important than the one that we're going to be learning about more today um, in the film, Belly of the Beast, but more importantly, um, these women, these two women, um, Kelly Dillon and Cynthia, Cynthia Chandler are, you know, people look for heroes and a lot of times, you know, you're looking in the graveyards, but these women, these two women are heroes and they are still working and they are still moving and they have organizations which need our support. And this particular, particular story is just so riveting because it's a story of great, great, great harm. And that's what the Ma'afa stands for. The Ma'afa is Kiswahili for great calamity or reoccurring disaster. And 
specifically around, around what happened to my people, people of African descent. Um, and if you think about who's incarcerated in California prisons, black women are definitely among the higher numbers in the population. Although the women who you're going to meet today, some of them are no longer with us, um, you know, are, are certainly a part of this, this horrible, horrible harm that the state of California in its Department of Corrections um, uh, uh, perpetuated on, on these women um, who, you know, when a person is incarcerated, they lose their agency. So what we're gonna do is because um, Kelly Dillon is actually, um, you know, the litigant whose case led the class action, whenever she is talking about this, whenever she we see the film and then she talks about this, she actually has, she's reliving this trauma. And, and we, we really want to, um, to hold her in, in a real special way so that the harm is not as severe as it could be. I know she probably has some things in place that she does, um, but you know we want to do something for her. And so what I wanted us to do, um, among other things, I wanted us to to offer her some loving kindness in a, in a concrete way. So what I want I want you all to participate in, and and of course we want to bring our ancestors into the room. You know the wombs that bore the wounds. You know we are living ancestors. But even if you're uh, a male person you are also born of a woman, <laughs> you know? So uh, what I was gonna suggest is that everyone drop the names of honored female ancestors into the chat. That's gonna be our river today. Drop names into the chat, honored ancestors. These are people that, um, that are no longer with us. And, and some of the women, you know, um, are no longer with us as well. So drop, drop some good energy into the chat um, to sort of hold the space for healing um, and hold the space, you know, for nurturing. Because as I said, this 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 film is it's really powerful. So I want you to visualize. You can hold your, you know, put your hand on on your your chest if you like. I want you to visualize a rosebud in the center of your chest. And if you want to um, soften your eyes, you can. And so as you um, you visualize this rosebud in the center of your chest. I want you to watch as the bud slowly opens and, and feel your heart center opening with it. And I want you to mentally repeat, this is you now, may I be happy. May I find peace in my life. I'm gonna do it three times. May I be happy. May I find peace in my life. May I be happy. May I find peace in my life. Now call to mind someone who you know is going through a difficult period. Imagine the warmth of your heart radiating out to this person. Use this person's name and repeat. May this person be happy. May this person find peace in his or her life. May this person be happy. May this person find peace in his or her life. May this person be happy. May this person find peace in his or her life. And now I want you to visualize um, Miss Kelly Dillon. And I want you to visualize these sisters that she represents. And I also want you to visualize Cynthia Chandler because she wasn't the victim, but she was right there. And I'm sure she was affected. And all those, her little girls were probably affected too, just as you know, Kelly's children were affected. So I want you to hold them now 
in your heart with this rosebud that's opening slowly. May Kelly and Cynthia and all of the women who were affected by this genocide find happiness. May Kelly and Cynthia and all of the women who are affected by this genocide find happiness. May Kelly and Cynthia and all of these women who are affected by this genocide and their families, of course, be happy and find happiness. May Kelly and Cynthia and all of these women and their families find peace in their lives. May Kelly and Cynthia and everyone affected by this genocide find peace in their lives. Ashe, and so it is. So Kelly Dillon is a survivor of domestic and gang violence. She became incarcerated at the age of 19 years old and was sentenced to serve a 15 year sentence. Her offense came from defending herself and children from her abuser that resulted in his death. Kelly's advocacy and community social work began by assisting fellow female inmates in peer counseling programs and social justice issues. This work led to her passion, purpose, and professional journey upon re-entry in 2009. Kelly L. Dillon is now the founder and executive director of Back to the Basics Community Empowerment Organization. She is working with the City of Oakland's Department of Violence Prevention as a program analyst to create strategies and program models to address the increase of gender-based violence. She serves on the Board of Commissioners for Community and Family Services in the City of Los Angeles. Kelly has worked as an advocate, consultant, and specialist in violence interruption and prevention services for over 15 years. In 2012, Kelly courageously staged, she, she staged <laughs> shared a testimony in front um, of the California Senate as a witness to the unlawful and uncivil acts against women in the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, CDCR. The re rehabilitation, we put that in quotation marks, like, really? Like, really? Like, really? Like, y'all is lying. Sorry. Um, <laughs> and women's, women's facilities uh, performed at local county hospitals. A human injustice toward women's reproductive health and rights. That was what this was. Her testament was key for Senate and Governor Jerry Brown to pass Senator Hannah Beth Jackson's SB 1135 anti-sterilization bill into a law. In 2020, her organization, Back to the Basics, co-authored the AB1007 bill with Assemblywoman Wendy, Wendy Carrero, Carrillo, sorry, that influenced Governor Gavin Newsom to sign into his budget for reparations granting the compensation for survivors of California's uh, sterilization program. Kelly takes a, uh, quote, boots on the ground, end quote, approach to address various forms of violence and offers her knowledge and commitment for California statewide efforts and her beloved city of Los Angeles. Kelly continues to give her personal testimony and professional expertise to promote awareness, prevention, and healing to anyone experiencing or has experienced a trauma and impact of violence. So welcome Kelly again. Thank you so much for joining us. Cynthia Chandler, and I'm gonna read the long bio. So y'all just like hang in there. Cause like I told you, these are heroes and you need to know like, I mean, this is just a bio. Like you really need to like do your homework, watch the film and ask them all those questions that you can't find answers to. You know, cause they heck of busy women, you know? Like who knows when they go, we, you know, they're gonna be here with us. <laughs> Cynthia Chandler is a change agent, founder, business coach and attorney. Her innovations include launching the first organization advancing the rights of HIV positive women in prison, creating the compassionate release process allowing for the release from prison of terminally ill people. 
co-founding the Eviction Defense Center in Oakland, California, and co-founding Critical Resistance and Justice Now, early prison abolitionist organizations influencing the Black Lives Matter Network. Cynthia has spent the last 20 plus years campaigning in partnership with people in women's prisons to end and win reparations for coerced sterilization of people in prison. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And one of those people and organizations is Kelly and her organization, as well as California Coalition for Women Prisoners. Um, I'm a former board member there. And I think our, our dear sister Hafsa is gonna be in the room so you can ask about that. Um, that's, I'm like, that's not in her bio. I'm just like ad in here, sorry. <laughs> um, the can this campaign that we're speaking about culminated in um, the end uh, and when, let's see what I'm saying. This campaign culminated in the legislative victory in 2020, making California the third state to provide reparations for survivors of historic state eugenics programs and the first state to provide reparations to people coercively sterilized in state prisons. So yay for California, right? Should have been doing it in the first place. Anyway, um, this campaign is documented and documented an Emmy award-winning and Peabody-nominated documentary, which you're gonna see today for free. And you're gonna get a link and you're gonna be good for a week. So you could like have your own little party and raise awareness like, yeah. Sorry, this is not her bio either, this is me. Um, belly of the beast. <laughs> Cynthia currently is working to uh, democratize the, the, the rule of law as director of Bali, B-A-L-I, Bay Area Legal Incubator, where she supports diverse attorneys in building successful law practices serving disenfranchised legal markets. Cynthia has received numerous prestigious honors for her contributions to social justice, including the Auburn Lives of Commitment Award celebrating women of moral courage. Yeah, I told you they wore wings, right? Yeah, they got like, they got wings, they got capes, you know, like, you know, whatever. Um, and she also got the inaugural Ford Foundation Leadership for a Changing World Award. Cynthia earned a JD from Harvard Law School and a master's in criminology from University of Cambridge. She has two activist children and she learns from them daily. So welcome again my heroes and we're so excited to have you and do you have a few words to share with our our um our audience before we watch the film i just want to say thank you so much for um just your interest for taking time out of your sunday i know we go we've gone through a lot in these last three years we go through a lot in the last week in the last 32 hours <laughs> so um but to just have to take the time out to just um, to watch the film, to learn more about like reproductive justice, um, to listen to the stories of the, not only the victims, but those that were the greatest allies that we could have ever had to bring justice to um, an awareness as to what was happening. I just wanna say thank you, thank you, thank you. We appreciate you. We appreciate your, your time because we know that if one person learns about one thing, they can teach and tell 10 other people and then those 10 other people can tell it. And this is a part of our history. It's, 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 it, even though it's part of my personal history, Cynthia's personal history, but this is, a, this is historical. It's historical for California and it's historical for um, just for, for women and just, it's just so many things in general, but please, and, and I, I want to say like, enjoy the movie because <laughs> the documentary is really deep, but it's entertaining at the same time. So, it, you know, it, it gets, it gets heavy. So I just want to kind of give you the trigger that it does get heavy. It gets really emotional, but there are moments of, um, of triumph. There's moments of, of laughter and, you know, and, and uh, victories and stuff like that, that is, is there too. So please, you know, Stay, you know, but if you need to take a minute to step away from the screening to gather, then that's fine. You know what I'm saying? But I will hope that you were able to strengthen and come back in so you can see the rest of what's happening. So I turn it over to Cynthia. Thank you, Kelly and Wanda. Thank you so much for the most gracious introduction. So thank you. Um, I want to echo what Kelly just said and, and encourage folks to, you know, watch it and and know that the story is bigger than us. 
you know, Kelly and I are here today as sort of ambassadors of this issue, but really to Erica Cohn, the filmmaker of Belly of the Beast's credit, she made it bigger than us. Um, and I think Kelly and I both wanted this film to be bigger than us. Um, I think it's a tale about how if you persevere and bond together across all kinds of barriers and, and build bridges with people uh, and keep fighting, you can create change and that we all have the power to make change happen. Um, so I, I hope, I find it, is, I find it oddly inspiring to watch despite the fact that it's part of my life. <laughs> And I hope that you all find it to be really inspiring too. So, Shana. All right, everybody. Um, I will get the film started. Let's all reconvene here back at around 3.45. The film runs one hour and 21 minutes. So at 3.45, we will back, be back for our discussion. There is a link in the chat to watch it independently if it is too glitchy for you on Zoom. And I am gonna get started with the screening on Zoom now. Thank you, everybody. I'm taking that journey. I haven't taken that journey in a while. So I'm thinking about happy endings and what Mary J. Blige sings, um, how um, it ain't over till it's over. So want to know if you could Talk about that happy ending, maybe bring us up to speed on what's going on now with regards to the reparations bill. And again, hey folks, these are our living heroes and you need to send some money to their organizations so that they can keep on doing that work. Oh, and Mac off the Genius Awards, like, yeah. And, and you know, heads, hands up to the director, Erica Khan and Angela Tucker and all of the other creative team members who made this a wonderful, wonderful story. I mean, really, I mean, it's like, it's something that people are gonna be watching when I pass away and I'm not going right at the moment. So Kelly and then Cynthia, and yeah. then we'll let people ask you questions. Yeah, so I'll, so it's, so it's the reparation piece is, is, is it has multiple layers to it, right? Um, and so I'm gonna have I'm gonna let Cynthia kind of just talk about right now what she's been working on because she's been doing some dynamic work around um, getting legal support um, for those who are trying to um, submit um, and apply for um, the reparations as survivors or even to see if anything has happened to them um, before. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to, this is what I'm going to speak to. So, so far as the happy ending, right? So of course that was a few years ago. Um, and um, I believe, so at first, of course, um, when you are incarcerated like that, you know, you the one thing that you hold on to is the fact that there's a happy ending outside of that oppression and that separation of family and whatever other tragedies you go through, right? And so many years, the happy ending for me would have been returning home to my family, uh, my, you know, my children, um, also maybe finding love and, you know, just, just this whole little, you know, what, what was present at the time. But now I've embraced the journey of what life brings, the good and the bad. And so now my definition of what happy is or my happy ending is, is that it, it, it has been, you know, transformed and it's been recreated. And I think that I have been choosing happiness all along. I have been choosing to look at the brighter a picture or to look at the purpose in a situation to bring about a happiness or to bring about a understanding of what happened and to, and to just get life out of it, right? And so I, I just think that I've been now learning how to um, make each moment every day a happy day or a peaceful day or, 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 you know, I, I have, you know, everybody have their bad days, just like anybody else. But I, I think that I'm living in my happiest time that I've ever had in my whole entire life. 
is because I know myself today. Like I like because I know who I am today. I know my worth. I know my strengths. I know my talents. I know, you know, the my 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 courage. It's like I know myself today. And so that it it it's it's different than who I was when I was going through that time of feeling helpless and hopeless and um defeated and discouraged in those times, right? So I just want to say that I'm speaking to that. Now, did I get a happy ending? Yes. We won, we fought, we got the reparations for the survivors, right? So that was one part. That was one part of the fight. However, you know that when you have an unseen systematic enemy, there is never you never can just totally like win a victory without them trying to find a way to either control that narrative or to control stuff out of it, whatever. And so we have been left to now have to continue on in a fight in which we thought we were, you know, at a, almost at a finish line last year. We have now had to to uh, move forward and continue on in the fight of having to still fight of, against systems uh, um, of oppression and um, and and um, that have that that is not making it easy for survivors and it's not making it easy for us to really get the justice that we've been so lonely waiting for, right? So. Um, it are did is the reparation program is it in effect? Yes, it is. But I would like to pass it over to um, Cynthia because this is this is this is Cynthia's lane in which she's been like I've been waiting for Cynthia to like like you see how young Cynthia was. So we're talking about thirty years ago almost. <laughs> you know that Cynthia started this fight with CDCR. You know what I'm saying? Of working with some of the women who were um, chronically had had been diagnosed with chronic chronically illnesses and you know diagnosis and so forth and fighting for them. And then it went into another thing with me. And then now she's still having to fight now from the outside, not going on the inside, but fight from the outside. With the, with the women, right, around the same issue, around these same types of issues. The system will never change. You know, we are, we are like, I, I'm going to speak to that because I'm going to speak to that, but I want to get to that because I have a, I need to speak to the moment of where we're at right now in time and to address where we're at right now. So I'm going to go ahead on and pass it to Cynthia. Thank you, Ms. Brenda. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I, first, I just want to echo back something that I heard in what Kelly just said, which is in that happiness is a level of optimism. And folks have asked uh, me and Kelly and also Erica Cohn, who who spent 10 years of her life creating this film, too. So we're, we were all in this for a very long haul. Like what kept us going? Um, and I, I always said like a little bit of pathology and that we can't quit. We are people who just don't and can't quit. <laughs> but there is also a huge amount of optimism, I think, in our spirits um, and really having faith that we are capable of, of making changes happen. Um, and I, I think that that is probably the recipe for what made this possible in many ways. Um, so in terms of what the reparations look like, I mean, the shaping the reparations, uh, we worked in tandem with folks from um, the Disability Rights and Education Fund and California Latinas for Reproductive Justice who had, had been historic, had been earlier looking at reparations for people who are survivors of historic eugenics. Um, and we brought into that um, collaboration a lot of wisdom from people in prison around what justice would look like. And uh, while this campaign was going on, Justice Now did interviews for about six years with people in prison about what justice might look like and what would reparations look like. And um, some of the elements that, that came out, um, one was that we needed to, do, uh, justice requires that violence stop. Right. So that was part of why we did our first effort to have sort of a sunshine statute to make it very clear to the Department of Corrections and its employees that they were breaking the law. But it's also why our most recent reparations um, 
bill had a component that mandates the state to notify people and tell them that they were sterilized. We know that many of the people sterilized in women's prisons were unaware of the fact that they were sterilized, like Kelly. Um, and so the violence continues, the state violence continues to be perpetuated if people are not notified. So that was one component. We also wanted an actual acknowledgement. I think what Kelly in the film mentions that there hasn't hadn't even been an apology. So part of what the legislation had included in it was an apology. Uh, the state is also now compelled to establish monuments uh, decrying the harms of eugenics historically and how the lesson lost around that led to and contributed to these more contemporary abuses. Um, and then finally, we wanted a moment both for reparation for people who are survivors, but also atonement for folks who had done harm. And this was a really important element of justice that was identified by people in women's prisons. Um, and that was where the reparations came in and making sure that it was a significant reparation. Um, it will never make anyone whole, um, but we wanted it to be something where it was more than just merely a token, um, where it, it was, seemed significant. And that's part of what we're going through now is, is the reparations process Folks have another year and a couple of months to be able to apply for reparations. And the implementation process is challenging. Um, things never go as one think that they would. Um, but our impact team, along with our uh, collaborative partners, uh, both California Latinas for Reproductive Justice and Disability Rights and Education Fund, but also um, California Coalition for Women Prisoners, and then um, some new folks that we've picked up along the way, uh, Loyola School of Law and Public Council and uh, the Los Angeles County Bar Association are all coming together to help make it so that folks can get representation and have a fighting chance to actually get the reparations that they're due. And that's sort of an overview of where we are. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, and not just that, um, there we, we've also just to kind of Piggyback on what Cynthia was saying, we also are kind of hit a, a brick wall a little bit around the memorial for the survivors. And so where we thought that the survivors would have a voice in, in, um, in shaping what that memorial would look like and who would also maybe, you know, um, the style or, or you know, of, of how we want to memorialize these events across the statewide. Um, CDCR somehow was able to wiggle themselves into the controlling factor of that and have absolutely um, discouraged and kind of created, um, I don't know what's the word I can look for, Cynthia, um, created like... Um, well, I think they've co-opted it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, from survivors participating and having a, a, a voice in the matter. And so we're, we'll be having an event in December at Berkeley uh, for survivors who uh, are either maybe for community members that may want to also help advocate for survivors around creating um, the memorialization of the, of the event that happened. So we're looking for that. So to sort of elaborate what Kelly's saying, you know, in designing what the reparations would look like, we did want to give an opportunity to atonement to the government agencies that were responsible for the historic sterilization abuse, as well as the Department of Corrections for the contemporary abuse. And in doing that, we wanted those agencies to be have some level of responsibility for making this monument happen. Unfortunately, um, the agencies have delegated the responsibility for running the monument process to the Department of Corrections, which is the most contemporary abuser, right? So it's like the, it's like giving the monument, the reins of control over this monument over to the, the agency that was the most abusive most recently. And um, instead of, instead of acting, coming to that responsibility from a space of atonement, atonement they're clearly coming to it uh, with the intention of having a big PR 
um, opportunity um, and a chance to make themselves look like heroes, uh, which they were not. So there's a community effort to build a people's monument um, uh, sort of in tandem to what the Department of Corrections and the state is doing. And artists are welcome too. Um, we're talking about and thinking about what such a monument really should look like, what would uh, where it should be, what what um, elements it should have, and what communities should be involved in it. Um, and so that's something that will be happening again in Berkeley in the new year. Yeah. How how do people find out about this um, gathering December 2nd? Like if who want to uh, attend, where do they go to find the information? Let me, well, as you ask the questions, let me go into the uh, email and see if I can um, share it with I can um, share with Shauna and Shauna can share with the attendees. Okay, great. Yeah, I wanted to share some of the comments. Um, so as you were speaking, uh, Cynthia, someone said about CDC, CDC taking over the, um, the, I guess, the physical monument around atonement, which it would be, you know, you know, the people's um, statement around around what happened so that it doesn't go away. Um, if this was, if the eugenics goes back, the law goes back to 1979, yet CDC did it anyway, <laughs> you know? And then the law said, okay, well, you didn't seem, you, you, you broke the law. And, and so we're gonna reinstate the same law again and include people who are incarcerated, but they were kind of already included anyway, but we're gonna say it, yeah. you know? So, which yeah. means that, it could happen again, maybe even. Right. Um, so, so someone said, "Yeah, that's counterintuitive to how CDC quotation mark. I mean, yeah. um, in parentheses, uh, parentheticals right. are operates." Right. And someone else said, "Yeah, Sheila, who was the person? Oh, you said that, <laughs> Kelly. Uh, yeah, Sheila, the abusers and harmers, you know, are in control of the uh, of the healing process. Which that's not that doesn't work. Why? Right. I mean, so it's... someone asked." Oh, sorry. Go I was going to say, it's a really interesting tension between sort of also I want to just raise up between the prison abolition movement versus reform movement. I mean, this is a, a clear example. Well, this is something, honestly, like I tend to approach all social justice work with sort of a, a learning mindset, right? Because we are trying to figure out how to create a nonviolent world where people are treated with humanity, right? And um and if we all had the solutions to that, we would all have Nobel Peace Prizes. And so, but like we're all working towards this, right? So I'm I feel like there are really important lessons to be learned in this process when we think about um African reparations, African slavery re reparations. Um and we really have to think very carefully in future reparations efforts, what it, what, what role, if any, um, perpetrators of state violence should have in that, in that reparation process. Um, and this has been a really, I think, important learning experience for us. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and an imperfect experience, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I sort of I wanna, oh. oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Let me just go back real quick before we move yes. forward to the conversation, right? Mm -hmm. So, because I, I was like, just like sometimes we be trying to do multiple things. So please forgive me for my distraction. But somebody said that this can help, this, you know, like this can happen all over again, right? And so even in the midst of us fighting and releasing Belly of the Beast, it was happening all over again. It was happening in the um, detention centers, the ICE detention centers and the immigrant detention centers, where we saw that, you know, um, Miss Wooten, who was a nurse, or Nurse Wooten, who was in there at the time, was discovering she was actually trying to address one thing, which she was addressing COVID-19 and how they were actually treating the women and the uh, women, especially particularly women of color, um, which is predominantly mostly probably mostly everybody in the detention center, but more so those that are of color, treating them. And in that, they discovered that they were getting these um, unnecessary hysterectomies and these false readings of cancer and things like that. And so what was happening just a couple of years ago in the detention center was really already true for what we were going through here. So what I've always discovered, because me and Cynthia has been in, in, a, in a hundreds of these types of discussions, is that this, why would you change something that works? 
And so if you notice, it's just like cancer moving or maybe something that's moving, it just migrates, right? It migrates into a different system in which it can hide in. So at first it started in slavery. So once that was abolished, they, you know what I'm saying, or either people start having a little bit more freedom, even though we know that there were so many other atrocities and, 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 and Jim Crow laws and stuff like that, that, that targeted um, African-American people, but it moved from slavery to then mental health institutions where people of color, you know, especially women of color, was de- if they was not able to be controlled, they were deemed as feeble or, or crazy or insane, and they was placed there. And then that's where they were able to perpetuate that. Okay, once they be, we began to start looking into mental health facilities, and then they were able to um, acknowledge those things that was happening there. If you notice that as soon as that, as most of the mental health detention center began to deteriorate as to a means of uh, um, uh, addressing societal issues, then prisons begin to spring up especially women's prisons. So they moved it from the mental health institutions or facilities into the actual correctional facility. And then now it's been moved from a correctional facility into a detention facility for immigrants. So if you notice that this this evil is just continuously, it just moves and migrates all, along our land. It doesn't go anywhere. Until we, you know what I'm saying? Until, and then so now, you know, and then now it's evolving in another way in which we are now having to deal with reproductive justice. If, you know, so it's like, I know that that right there between spiritual, race, you know, different things like that. We on a, you know, America's on a divide of how, how we are looking at reproductive justice at this particular moment. But still, all of those things play into who gets to decide who lives, who dies, who has children, who doesn't, who, who's worthy of medical care and who's not, right? These things is continuously perpetuating itself. And you would have thought that after over a hundred or something years of having to um, fight in order to get to the place where we're in 2000 and 2022, but yet and still, it seems like we have just within the last five or six years, we have went back into time for over a hundred years. We're almost really back in that time right now. You know what I'm saying? So, um, and then in some of the conversations that we're having, so it never really, mo- it never, it's never, we we are not killing, we are not, we're not, we are not chopping the head off of it. We're really at this time, and which what we've always been doing is just dealing with the situation system, systematically. Like this reparations that we're dealing with right now, even though it means a lot to me, it is just a medication. It is just a medication for a larger diagnosis of a situation. You know what I'm saying? And it's enough to just like how when we holler and scream in pain, well, us as survivors have been hollering and screaming in pain and the reparations was just to calm the calm the people down, to calm the, the pain down. But yet it's still nobody is really going after trying to extract the situation that's really at hand. And that's where we keep finding ourselves in. So it's like, even though like you... Like, um, and there's so many other ways that this thing shows up. So I, even though I know we're kind of talking about belly of the beast, but we also, like I tell, like me and Cynthia, we, sometimes we even have our offline discussion and we had an offline discussion is not to target or villainize Planned Parenthood, but we had a conversation about the, the pros and the cons of Planned Parenthood in school systems. And so we know that, you know, so where is it that, that young women are now being offered the birth control, you know, pills and methods and stuff like that. But yet still, we have experimental uh, reproductive um, uh, strategy, you know, anti-birth strategies, whatever, that is being uh, pushed upon our low-income, predominantly, you know, urban communities of, you know, children of color being pushed up on them with um with no supervision. You get what I'm saying? With no supervision. With not understanding what is the health concerns or either like, you know, what's going on or to have that that true care and wrap around for people that's on ground to advocate for those particular individuals. So these things are not just about, I, mean, I know we're here to talk about belly of the beast, but belly of the beast is just uh, a, it's a conversation starter, an eye opener, 
in a in a in a means of mentally and spiritually and emotionally waking up the people as to like what's really going on here because when people watch Billy of the Beast, they say like, damn, this shit was happening right under our nose. Like how did and it, and for if and then when you and then when like as Erica presented and Angela presented in the film, how did we not know that thirty two thousand individuals over a course of time was sterilized under this federal law? Mm-hmm. or mandate how do we not know that you know what i'm saying and it was a lot of other institutions that got away with being a part of it now sometimes i out those institutions and sometimes i don't but it was a lot of other institutions that was not just along with cdc mind you cdc is the last of of minty many <laughs> my, my grandma would say minty minty facility <laughs> That southern, you know, like the Medea, Minty, it's been Minty things, but it's, but no, it's a, a many, many other institutions that has that allows to contribute to the perpetuation and the continuation of these levels of crimes against humanity. Mm-hmm. You know, when when we were doing the Sunshine Statute, the first one, where we were just trying to to trying to at least attempt to stop the forced um, and coerced sterilizations inside the prisons, I I was being asked by many right wing radio stations if I would be a guest because they wanted to have me as a guest because they assumed I would be anti-abortion um, because somehow um, trying to stop stop sterilizations that were coerced in their mind meant that we were setting a precedent to be able to um, stop access to abortion also. Um, And I, you know, I actually accepted those invitations just so I would have a chance to be on those shows and say, no, actually, you're completely wrong. We have to start seeing that um, prohibiting abortion and coercing people into sterilization are part of the same package. They are part of the state attempting to decide who can have a family, who's not allowed to have a family, who can have a future, who cannot have a future, um, who must have a future versus who can never have a future. Um, And we have to start, you know, figuring out ways to build bridges uh, across these sort of siloed topics around reproductive freedom and focusing on reproductive freedom, reproductive justice overall, right? So that we can get then, I think that nuanced um, look so that we can start intersecting racial justice into discussions of reproductive justice as well, for sure. Yeah, I was thinking as as you were speaking, Kelly, um, and thank you so much about showing how you know, belly of the beast and and this fight um, to stop the legal sterilization of, of women who the state have confined, you know, which is another form of slavery because you, you belong, your body belongs to those people. Um, you don't have any, I mean, you can think freedom, but your body is theirs, you know? It's not much you can do if they've got your body and that's our house in this particular spirit form, right? So um, yeah, so the conversation, it it is a conversation starter because the song says what's going on, right? And it's not like that's the only thing that's going on is, you know, it's really complex and it's complicated. We go back to 1909, looking at eugenics. Um, There are a lot of comments, um, you know, with regards to um, uh, some of the things you all have talked about, one one question, I only saw one question with a question mark. <laughs> it asked about sort of, you know, your, um, how you keep yourselves um, mm. fortified, you know, emotionally and spiritually to be able to do this work. Cause it's been a long haul kind of work and it's not going away. The, the systems that are in place presently perpetuate, you know, these kind of things happening, support these kind of things happening. and you know, it, it, it's not gonna stop right at the moment. You know, hopefully, you know, we arrest it. And also I wanna let folks know that um, the um, the community uh, sterilization memorial will be at the Ed Roberts Center in Berkeley in, uh, in January, uh, 2023. And uh, if you follow wandaspix.com, 
um, or if you just stay in touch um, with myself or Shauna, we'll have the exact information once it comes up. And I'm sure uh, on Kelly's website, it'll be there too. But um, we just stay in touch. So I want to let you respond to that. Because um, like I said, um, there are not many questions, just, just you know, uh, comments that, you know, your, your people are here in the chat. <laughs> Kelly, do you want to handle the idea of how do you keep going or do you, what do you want to do? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it quick in it because I'm going I'm to slide it back to you. Um, I was doing fine until the movie came out. Okay. I didn't realize that I had suppressed it and moved on with it. Um, I was doing so much speaking at the time on so many different issues. So I, I was speaking not just on behalf of the sterilization, but I was also speaking on behalf of domestic violence in the African-American community and how services were um, countywide. It was a lot of things I was already doing. And, but when the movie came out and I was able to see myself from that time on that deposition and even through the whole fight, I, it fucked me up really bad. And I crashed mentally and emotionally. Um, and all of that anxiety, the panic, everything just resurfaced. And so it took a moment, it, it's taken about the last two or three years to actually process something that I never did allow myself to process, but just was surviving. And that's what we've had to do as a people. We've had to just survive a thing because it's just been one thing hitting us after another. One thing, one bullshit, one thing we have to fight. And this group of people, we have to fight it. This system shit, we got to fight. And then, you know, and then we have to fight within our own family sometimes because the trauma is so bad that we end hurt people, end up hurting other pe people within the family that we're supposed to love. And so I, it took a moment for me to learn how to, even though I have found a voice to advocate for those things. I didn't have, I never, I didn't, it took me a moment to advocate for the voice for me to be, for me to take care of me, to protect me, to, um, to demand to be treated and handled a certain way. You know what I'm saying? To be handled a certain way. Um, but watching Belly of the Beast, it messed me up. To see, like, I was like, man, this is that's effed up. But I, but it allowed me to give myself the empathy and the and the concern, and to hold me, and like, like, if I was to hold a sister, or hold a a daughter, or somebody, and say, baby, that's it's it's it, it, that's messed up what they did to you, and I had to tell myself that. I had to tell myself like that's fucked up what they did to you you did not deserve to go through that you know what i'm saying and i had to give myself the nurture and the love that was needed and necessary but secondly it takes a village and i'm gonna tell you cynthia like right now like let me just say this is that we're like right now we're in this place of where it's now jews and blacks and hispanics and blacks and whites and in Palestinian, it's all just all this kind of crazy stuff that's going on. And and it's in 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 the midst of trying to find strength and liberation, you know, the the one thing that that in the midst of trying of people trying to find that that liberation and that strength is to, to begin to um you know not just segregate themselves but also say like this person's been the enemy and these people have been the enemy like that. So I get it. But my, my main support has come from Cynthia. It's come from Erica. It's come from another woman by the name of Eve Sheedy. It's come from Georgia Horton, who was a former member of mine. It, it's come from women who were, and uh, Danielle Killian, who were Mormon, Jewish, Catholic, you know, like all of this, you know, this stuff going on. And they, they are, they are, women who look white you know what i'm saying i wouldn't just say because they got other stuff going on but they but you know like erica's jewish you know what I'm saying? But she looks white but here's the thing they have they it, it was it's a tr it was a true like love you get what i'm saying 
it, it, it was true love where my family couldn't even give me that. Where my family still was probably dealing with their own guilt about not being what they needed to be for me in those moments, or even probably they couldn't. They was busy living life or whatever, but my own family that couldn't give me that. So not all, so it was God and 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 just touching me and strengthening me to learn how to love me, but it was also the sisterhood. Of, of all of the individuals that were handpicked to be in my life through these moments and through this lifetime that I would have never picked for myself. That I would have never, so here's the thing, I would have never picked these people for myself. I probably would have seen Cynthia coming in and out, you know, like, okay, that's the white lady that be coming up in here to see, you know, the rest of the team, Chopper them and all the rest of them, right? But, um, I would have never picked Cynthia to be my friend because I probably would have thought Cynthia didn't want to be my friend. You get what I'm saying? I would have never picked Erica. But this but this circumstance in life brought us together and it gave me a family. You know what I'm saying? So I was able to, um, I was able to embrace love, not the idea of, of what I wanted love to be, and not the idea of the package in which I wanted love to come through, but I had to embrace what love was presenting itself as, if that makes sense. And so, and it showed up in Cynthia, showed up in Erica, showed up in Eve, it showed up in these other people. And those were the times that they were able to love me and, and tell me and show me through their love and their support for me who I was when I couldn't stand to see myself in the mirror because all I saw was a broken shattered young woman that life had did that too so I was looking at it from the from the brokenness and the shattered pieces of trauma but they were seeing me for the greatness of who they saw in me and what I can become so sometimes in those times you you get to a place where you can't even care for yourself are you not strong enough to do that for yourself? You need people around you or even to shine a light on the ability to, to see and recognize, just like when a nurse come into the hospital room, you know what I'm saying? You recognize the fact that you're in a state in which you cannot care for yourself. So this person is here to do that for you. That's what I had to do with the love that they have for me. So I'm just keeping it 100. You know what I'm saying? It's like, um, but then, but, but those were the, those are the things that happen behind closed doors that if people really got your back, that they'll watch you in your most vulnerable, broken moment. They won't exploit it. They won't, they won't expose it, but then they'll get you straight to put you back out there so you can stand as the leader, the shero, the hero, whatever it is that other people may see you as. That's what they did for me. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Yeah, I wanted to mention that um, Deanna Henderson is with us and um, wanted to um, ask Shauna, I don't know how we would be able to um, let her join the conversation. Oh, there she is. Cool. Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. There you go. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, hi, Kelly. <laughs> hi, Cynthia. <laughs> hi, Wanda. Um, I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about my experience with Heinrich and um, what I went through. And his he made a statement to me that did not allow me to heal for a super, super long time. And I, too, like shut down until the belly of the beast was made. And I just figured, okay, he got away with it, you know, and who else is going to step up and speak. And um, after my hysterectomy and after I finally found out about it, um, I went into his office for my first 
visit with him to check what he had done. And um, I asked him, why did you do this to me? You said you were going to remove two growths. And he got up, he walked over to the door and he closed the door. And he came back and he sat down and he said, I'm tired of you pretty young, long haired girls coming in here. You stay here, you become a bunch of, excuse my language, hot asses. You go home, you do the wild thing, you do the nasty, you get pregnant, and we got to pay for it. Us taxpayers have to pay for it. I was in deep shock. And I'm still trying, I still question today, where did he get that kind of comfort with me to voice that? Like, I still don't understand. Like, I, I, it puzzles me all the time. Like, why me? Why did you tell me that? And I don't know if he told anybody else that, but from the other people that have had the sterilizations, nobody has said anything. And so I kind of think, I, I feel like he felt comfortable enough to tell me that. I, I'm just dumbfounded over it still. And um, if I could have it my way, you know, the reparations, like that's part of an I'm sorry, but my heart of hearts, we all had to go to prison and do time for what we did. Why isn't he in prison? Why isn't he in prison? He took away so much from so many women. He abused us mentally, emotionally, and physically. It, but he's still free. But let a Native American or a Mexican or 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 a African American do any of those three, and we're locked up. We're locked up. I don't. I don't get it. So um, I, I'm. I'm grateful for everybody that has helped me to um, get the reparations and to have a voice and to be able to share the things that have gone on, you know, I'm grateful to be home and have a second chance. And um, if any of you guys need help with anything, like, please don't hesitate, call me, you know, call me, I'm here. If anybody wants to hear, you know, um, what I have to say is like, I'm more than welcome to share it, like, had I had known what I was signing up for, like I took him at face value that like he said he was gonna remove these two growths. So okay, he works for a CDCR, you know, he had to be a little upstanding. So I didn't question it. I didn't read my paperwork. I signed it. And I don't know how many other people did the same thing. They just signed it thinking they were signing up for what he was saying he was gonna do. And I feel like in the heart of hearts that he thought he could play God and take that right away from us. As Native American, we're life givers. Women are the only life givers on the planet and we're connected to mother earth. And he took that, he didn't just take that right away from me. Spiritually, he took from me, you know? And um, it hurts my heart. It hurts my heart. Granted, I was I was blessed to have some children before I went in, but what if I would have gotten out ten years earlier, and wanted wanted to start another family? You know, he took that from me, and he's still walking around. You know. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind. I'm just gonna say this real quick and just really move because we need we need we need to have like a healing uh circle for us, right? In which we've been trying to reach out to different and every every organization kind of deal with their own set of survivors. And so, what we really do need to do within the next like maybe within the next month or so, or maybe after the holidays, at least January or sometime before we get ready to go to this memorial meeting, like for the memorial. That, yep. we, that we need to have a healing circle, right? But okay. I hear you about the doctor 
And um, because the, that, that doctor was over there at BSPW, but our doctor was at, you know, CPWS, and he was the other, he was the African American doctor that was a part of it. It's hard to go after one particular person when they were allowed to, to, to perform the things that they was able to perform because they feel like they were under a uh, umbrella. Umbrella, and not only umbrella, but also an assignment. Right. I can't, you can't you can't punish the 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 person that you know that that carries out the assignment. You have to go after who assigned them. Right. So, so like as you look at the as you guys were able to see the movie, and that's why we were trying to you know get people to understand that some of this stuff was inside of um, CDC policy to be able to perform these sterilizations. Right. So. Yeah, I'm just gonna you know, like that. could I could I just add in a couple of things? One is thank you for coming out today and sharing. Just thank You're you welcome. so much. And um, I think that um, higher up actors in the Department of Corrections and also the state legislature emboldened attorney uh, uh, doctors like Heinrich. Um, and other doctors too. I want to point out that like we, you know, we had to focus on kind of a, a boogeyman for the, the narrative arc of the film. Um, right. But the sterilizations that the Belly of the Beast film was able to uncover, we uncovered about 1400 questionable sterilizations, questionable in terms of consent over the last 20 years. And those sterilizations were performed at 13 different hospitals, including two UC teaching hospitals. Um, so this was systemic in the medical profession. Um, the, the doctors were not only not prosecuted, they were not even disciplined by the medical review board, which is the licensing body in the state. And the reason that we were given for why they weren't uh, disciplined was that they had been encouraged to do these sterilizations. They had been given um, a special supposed letter, although we were never able to verify and see that letter. So, you know, either they were just protecting those folks or they really did provide them a letter encouraging them to start doing sterilizations during labor and delivery and other medical procedures. Um, they were being encouraged to break the law and, and then they were protected once they did it. You know, so this was really, um, you know, it took us 20 years to get 25 years really to get to where we are today in part because there were so many high up officials who were part of this on a systemic level they were part of this abuse and the perpetuation of it and the justification of it right and thinking that it was normal um and reasonable and even now i mean with these with these um discussions you know, uh, kelly and i have been talking a lot of different places and and because i'm the lawyer i sometimes i frequently get sort of sent out to talk to sort of white professionals about this topic. And so I've been talking to a lot of doctors and I've been talking to residency training programs that are training the next generation of OBGYN. So the next generation of gynecologists and over and over again, these residents who are about to be the future doc leaders, medical leaders are saying things like, oh, wow, I didn't realize that protections against forced sterilization wasn't just, you know, some extra loophole that we put low income people through. I didn't realize that there was a reason like they had no knowledge of eugenics. They had no knowledge of sterilization abuse. They are not being taught about it in school. In fact, they're being told by their higher up folks um, that it's just a nuisance that they have to have these protective regulations in place. Uh, so it's so important for um, us to make sure that this history is not lost right and and to make sure that people really understand the harms of population control that are ongoing um so thank you so much um for um for attending um deanna and uh look forward to seeing you at um some of these healing um spaces that um we need to create um for survivors um because you don't want to survive you want to thrive and and get beyond this well you can't really get beyond it because it is it happened but you know um you know experience that joy and happiness um because you are free so thank you so much and i'm sure we'll see each other um well we're kind of like um running into your 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 time now <laughs> and, and you know we don't like 
we don't want to, you know, keep you beyond on your beyond your comfort zone. So I just wanted to, um, before I, I give you all the last word, and then Shauna comes back on, I wanted to mention, I don't know if you're familiar with with um, Ma'at. And, and um, Ma'at is, is, um, is a comedic um, symbol for for justice, the good justice. <laughs> and, and there are 42, um, 42 laws. Um, and a lot of people, they read over the laws every day at the beginning of the day. And then they remind themselves at the end, like, was I honest today? You know, um, <laughs> did, did I, did I, you know, was, you know, did I offer forgiveness to today? You know, some of those kind of things. And I just want to read what's on this, um, bookmark that my daughter made for me. My eye became identified with truth, righteousness, justice, order, balance, harmony, and reciprocity. In some respects, it held sway over all forms of rightness, including goodness and joy, that is the African, as the Africans called it, the expansion of the heart. My eye is a term with numerous meanings in the literature, but all of these meanings tend to point in one direction. Um, and, and what I, uh, one of the concepts of Ma'at is like the foundation of human life. Um, you know, the promotion of sanity, order, balance, harmony, peace, and justice among human beings. And that's a um, Malefi Asante, um, 2011. That's where the quote came from. But, but Ma'at is like a bird and, and, and you look at the feather. Um, justice is not blind in the African uh, cosmology. It's not blind. And then the feather, um, your, you know, so the feather hangs on the balance. And if your deeds are lighter than the feather, that's what you're going for, right? Doing no harm, literally. So, so I just want, I want to sort of leave everyone with the idea of ma'at, you know, truth and justice and reciprocity and treating people as you want to be treated and holding people in our hearts and, and wishing, wishing each other, you know, love and joy and happiness not just with words, but what we do to facilitate that. So anyway, I just wanted to offer that. And, um, and thank you both so much for joining us. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to have the last word before Shauna comes back on and closes the program officially. Um, so, someone, I just want to do this last little thing right here. Someone, I think Zaire said, can these incarcerated victims and their families ever be free? of the systematic abuse. So my my thing was none of us are truly free. <clears throat> we all have been held hostage and victimized by power, hate, and oppression, but spiritually we can be free. That freedom that comes within that cannot be pen penetrated without permission, right? And that's what you see when you visit, when, when, when you go and I think Cynthia has the privilege of being on the other side of the wall and she sees the love and the joy and us singing and us doing this and making things and the love that we have is that that, that this incarcerated body, like or the body is incarcerated, right? But, but internally, we find things to survive. We find joy. We find love. We find peace in order to keep surviving, to keep going. And... Um, and to move through, right? And so I have come to the conclusion as I could see there's after you have been victimized in such ways, you you your the lens of the way you look at things in life is now is now there is the in the naivety, the innocence is gone. So I can see systematically the patterns that happen from in television and music and just the slightest things. So for me, I have to find that freedom within. So that's my thing is that there's a power. So I just want to end of my saying that there's a power that's within us that, um, that, we, that we are in control of, that we, we own, that no one can take from us, right? And it allows us to endure. It allows us to persevere. It allows allow us to rise up and make purpose out of the most painful situations. And, and that is what I will say that 
in, in the moment that we are in right now that we have to live it. We have to, we, I think it's the time from the pandemic to now that we have been, there's a call to, to know ourselves in that manner. There's a deeper call for us to get back in tact, touch with that piece of us, which makes us human and separated from animals. When someone doesn't have that peace, then they're not connected to their peace. They can do things like this with no sense of consciousness as an animal would do. You get what I'm saying? So um, a savage animal. So if they don't have that, that spiritual peace in them, there's no way that they can connect to humanity. So, you know what I'm saying? So I, that's, I just want to, I, I know that sounds a little bit, a little bit off, but that's where I'm at right now with just saying that that right now it's like we we have to be in this space of understanding the higher the higher self of us in this moment you know what i'm saying um because we're right now we're in the space where we're not getting better we're not getting better right now so we're gonna have to find a way to find our community and also find a way to survive that comes from within. That's that's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. uh, Cynthia, I just thought of something. I forgot. I've got these notes I've been writing as you all were speaking. But um, I wanted to mention that um, that that I, I knew Chopper, and mm -hmm. uh, and I want to say Ashe, and I got a chance to visit her before she passed, and she was free, and she was happy, um, and but she was sick because um, you know she was a victim of the horrible. Can you even call it a medical system? Because it, it doesn't exist um, around around cancer and just letting it grow and um, and just take over her whole body, which was really unfortunate. Um, and also, I wanted to mention that um, that I met Georgia because I I was part of a visiting team, so I got a chance to go in uh, visit sisters and visit women as a uh, part of uh, CCWP on the uh, sister to sister visiting team. And Georgia and a girlfriend was happening. <laughs> Great program, and I'm so happy. You know, she's been free for a minute. You know, down at uh, with a uh, sister Burden. Um, you know, her place in in the Los Angeles County, doing great work. So I just wanted to mention those names. Um, you know, I I didn't uh, get to answer the question about how to keep doing this work, um, and I wanted to just say that uh, I kept doing it, keep doing this work because everything I've learned about loyalty and dignity and perseverance and um, keeping a sense of self, uh, as well as keeping a higher purpose that really is the key to keeping going. Everything I've learned about that, I've learned from people in prison. And uh, it's been an incredible honor to do this work as a comrade to folks inside. So, and thank you, Kelly. I learned from you every day, including today. Thank you. Well, thank you both for your work. And I hope you've been able to read the chat or you can save it and you know put it in your feel good <laughs> binders because <laughs> you got a lot of support here. <laughs> uh, Shauna, there you are. Thank you so Hi, much. Yeah, thank you all. I mean, we're all very honored to have you. And I think you're all inspiration for what we as regular people could do to help, you know, fight these systems that, you know, seem to continue to put us down. So thanks again, Kelly Dillon, Cynthia Chandler, and again, Wanda Severe. Your work is amazing. And um, you could check out some of her other woundfulness gathering programs on our YouTube page. Um, Several of them are, are wonderful for healing. Um, thanks again for this program, everyone. And check us out on sfpl.org. Pick up the movie at or the film at our library and registrants. Um, your link will be good till uh, November 19th. Thanks again, everybody. And Ashe. Ashe, thank you.